possible enforcement action that the Africa HSCLSC could face. These are specific legal arguments. So please understand what I'm writing before you do yours. Legal arguments means things that could happen in court of law if they don't do it when they are charged to court, okay? Prioritize three actions and justify the selections, okay? So just counted words. Moral and financial arguments for all the actions should not be more than 300 or 350 words. Your specific legal arguments should not be, should not exceed 100 to 150 words. Your likelihood and severity should not exceed seven, between 75 to 150 words. And how effective the action is likely to be in controlling the risk uh, that is there. So, as you can see, moral, general, legal, and financial arguments. This is an example I put in place for you to, you know, go through to understand what they mean. First, what is a moral duty? You see, the moral duty of an employer is to protect all his workers working to earn money, you see, to prevent workers from risking their lives from, you know, hazards. I only use this as an example. So you have to ensure that you put a specific hazard because of what you are writing. You know, you are choosing only three types of hazard. Oh, sorry. You are choosing only three types of serious hazard you want the organization to assess immediately. Okay, electric shock, falling of equipment from height, and any form of fire hazard present, okay? From height. And any form of hazard present, and risk associated with their work activities. Why I included this is because, you know, most of the risk and hazard we are going to be putting, some of us might not use the same as a construction site, some might use an hospital, some might use, uh, you know, an ice making factory, some might use a rubber plant factory, you see, lots of things. You can use an oil and gas industry. So I'm only giving you an example of the moral duty. The moral duty of all employees in the whole world is to ensure that they protect all their workers. They provide safe equipment. They provide safe, you know, workplace. All these are the work required from the owner of an organization, okay? And some of these ill health condition or injury that workers suffer on site have impact in the lives of the employee with long-time injury and ill health, which can also result to psychosocial hazard of workers. You see, some people, after they leave their work, now they develop cancer, or now they have kidney problem, or they have liver problem, or, you know, they're always having vibrating white fingers. All these things, all these things are the reason why you have to ensure you take good care of your workers. These are moral duties of what an employee should do to their employers. And what these are moral duties of what an employer should do to their employee. And financial impacts that the company might face include direct and indirect costs. First, what are direct and indirect costs? Direct costs are the costs that come immediately when there's an incident, okay? And indirect costs are the things that are the costs that come after an incident. Some will be insured and mostly large amount of it cannot be insured. Okay, and the replacement of work equipment or damaged infrastructure following an incident and accident. Fine imposed in prosecution from criminal court following an incident or accident. 
This is the legal argument that you have. Because financially, nobody will impose fine on you. Morally, nobody will impose fine on you. Only when you are charged to court because of your negligence, of what you did not do, that made your employees get affected by the work they carry out on your behalf. Okay? You might be imposed, uh, big fine might be imposed on the organization that you have to pay. Aside that, work activities will not be allowed to carry on on the site. Okay? And justification of number one, where most of us have um, problem with, you see, what is the action you are putting in place? Purchasing a MEWP to allow worker access safely accessing when working at height and installation of safety nets at every third floor of the project to prevent objects falling from height. And this you can find in the hazard category worker type. You see, from one of the hazards I wrote, I had to pick three. According to the boss, you have to submit three justifications for the work you are doing for the report you are writing. So my first justification I wrote about work at height before I wrote about confined space. So now we are going to be writing about work at height, okay? And the specific legal arguments, they, these ones are what courts of law, either for criminal law or um, Specific legal arguments. These are criminal law and fine imposed on companies, you see, by the court of law. It's a possible enforcement action that the company, I only use Africa HSC LLC, okay, could face include stopping all work activities on site which could delay in handling of project contract. You see, when you are being awarded the contract, you are expected to submit it in maybe um uh, two years or one year and a half, then because of an accident that made your work stop in one or two months, you know you have to rush it. And when rushing, there are lots of things that could go wrong, okay? And the organization could face possible prosecution for criminal court and fine that range from 100,000 dirham to 1 million dirham, depending on how severe the injury sustained due to the organization negligence and non-compliance with the minimum requirements of ILO convention or recommendation. You can see the organization can face possible prosecution from criminal courts and fines that range from 100,000 to 1 million dirham, depending on how severe the injury sustained is due to the organization negligence and non compliance with the minimum requirement of ILO convention or recommendation. I want you to find out the mistake here. As you can see, I wrote ILO here. What is ILO? Here also, I wrote MEWP. First, what is MEWP? It's called Mobile Elevating Work Platform. Okay, and here, the ILO is called International Labor Organization. So I'm only putting this so we understand what we are talking about. You don't have to write in short form. You have to write in full form to show that you know what you are saying. And for me, I'm including a local law for you, you might include uh, the recommendation analysis for or C155 or C120, anyone that suits your hazard and, you know, complements your hazard and you know, yes, this article says exactly what you are writing about. Then you choose it. But for me, I'm choosing the local law from the Abu Dhabi uh, Code of Practice 23.0, which states that employers shall evacuate each site or operation to determine if fall hazard are present and the workplace shall be using risk management practices as required. This is from Code Abu Dhabi Code of Practice 23.0. Okay, and for you, if you are using an international law, you have to include 
the article number, okay? And consideration and likelihood. Consideration of likelihood and severity. The likelihood of injuries occurring on site, okay? From working at height is high. We all know that, that the higher the distance of what is falling, the more the impact. If you want to try this, buy a watermelon. I think that one is not expensive. Put it down, connect a you know pipe upstairs, like about first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor, and so on and so forth. Then start dropping an hammer. Start dropping a hammer inside the pipe. So it's it's that watermelon because the watermelon serves as a human head. So when gravity takes place from first floor, second floor, third floor, you can see the impact will be different. And the more severe the risk is, and the hazard is. So, because I'm writing about a precast company, you know, where they do precast panel, this is due to lifting of precast panel and using of scaffold regularly for most bricklayers, masons, and where they're carrying out work in this area. Why is working at height high? Is because every day when there is panel to be erected, the uh, the crane will leave the panel, place it, then the uh, bricklayer will do his work, the welder will do his work by connecting the uh, iron, the you know mason also will do their work by holding and drilling, uh, offsetting the panel. All this will be put in place, okay? Those are the things you consider. And the severity of the risk occurring could be fairly serious. Injuries are likely to reach from minor injuries such as bruises, sprain, strain. And you have slightly more serious injuries because, you know, I'm talking of from first floor, second floor, third floor, such as fractures, deep cuts, or puncture from objects falling from height, or very, very serious injuries such as head chattering or internal injuries on the head for workers falling from height. All you just say is, ah, bars, colors. That's all. So when you are working at height, please always remember to use your safety harness and so on and so forth, okay? These are very, very serious injury for someone falling from height. And now, how effective is your action likely to be in controlling the risk? And this must include all this, okay? The intended impact of the action, justification for the time scale that you indicated in your risk assessments, that I told you in the justification in your risk assessment that you don't write exactly what I write. You have to put the exact time. Okay, if you're expecting them to complete the provision of tools in two weeks, they have to complete it in two weeks. If they have to provide it in one month, they have to provide it in one month, or else they will be charged to courts and penalty will be given to them, okay? And this is an example. Provision of mobile elevating work platform, as I told you before, MEWP, will improve working practice, working practices in the area where work at height is necessary. You see, when they are trying to erect the panel, scaffold might not do a thing because you have to lift the panel over the scaffold, then try as much as possible to bring it down slowly. And if there's any problem, or maybe the sling, not broken. You know what is going to happen. The panel will fall and start damaging the scaffold. Bye, 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 bye. And if there are lots of people working on the scaffold, you know what that is. That's a disaster, very big one. So instead of that, you use a mobile elevating work platform that you just control it with your hands. It moves you up, left, right, anything you want to do, it will be easier for you to work. And at the moment, workers tend to work at height without safety harness, which the hazard is high, you know? And time scale of two days have been given to HSC Africa because equipment is necessary. You see, this is the time scale I'm giving them. To ensure that their employees don't just fall and die, they should provide it within two days. So it saves employees from falling from height after all control measures have been put in place. What are the control measures you are talking about. Your hierarchy of control. 
the elimination method, the substitution method, the engineering control, the administrative control, and the last but not the least, the personal protective equipment. Okay. And time scale of one month has been suggested to the company to provide safety nets on every third floor of the project to prevent items, tools, and debris of work falling from height. When there is safety net, even if somebody is falling from up, if he's falling from ninth floor or sixth floor, since there is another safety net after like about three feet, the impact will be reduced. It will come down slowly, slowly, slowly. Then the person might hang inside the safety net will help arrive. Okay? And this will complete will completely eliminate bruises, sprain, and most serious injury like fracture or deep cut from the impact of falling objects. So you understand what we are talking about now. Okay? Whether you think the action will, be, will fully control the risk, this is why we have to provide safety net. You see, when safety net is there, any debris that is falling down will fall on that safety net. And at the end of the day, somebody will be there to maintain the safety net. Even before early everyday duty, somebody will try as much as possible to remove all the debris on the safety net so daily activities can start. Now we we'll go to the second justification of the uh, confined space entry. You see, what are the actions you need to take? Provision of RPE and emergency procedure. You see, for work in, in confined space. Possible enforcement action that the Africa HSLSC could face. These are specific legal arguments, so please understand what I'm writing before you do yours. Legal arguments means things that could happen in court of law if they don't do it when they are charged to court, okay? Possible enforcement actions that the Africa HSCLLC could face include shutting down of all work activities on site due to incidents of accidents. Incident or accident, sir. Accident investigation of the confined space. This means after the accident or incident have happened, then you came there to do your risk assessment. Things the company might face, you see, finds the company might face. The organization could face prosecution from criminal court and fine ranging from 150,000 dirham to 2 million dirham, depending on how severe the injury sustained, is due to organization negligence and non compliance with minimum requirement of ILO convention and recommendation. As you can see, previously I used almost the same word, okay? But I'm using a different local code of practice 27.0 which states that employment employer shall develop and implement a training program appropriate to ensure that all relevant employees who enter a permit required confined space prcs acquire the understanding knowledge and skill necessary for the safe performance of all duties assigned under prcs program as long as all employers provide training for their staff all the staff and employees understand what they are supposed to do in case of emergency. Your consideration of likelihood with hazardous substance present in the confined space, you know, you remember due to welding, okay? Those are the hazardous substance. It's more likely that workers are at risk of explosion, loss of consciousness because they inhale too much of that, uh, you know, wedding gas or asphyxiation. You see, these are the things that can happen to someone in a confined space. That is why you have to provide that panic alarm button. So immediately they start losing confidence, <laughs> perhaps the present. So anytime there is something like that, somebody can rush to rush to assist them. The likelihood of ill health occurrence is quite high for confined space. That is the likelihood. So what about the severity? 
how severe, you know, how dangerous, how the impact is going to cause problem, how disastrous it's going to be. So most of the general public are not currently aware of the risk because these operations are carried out in an enclosed area. You see, this is how, why it's always severe. People working in oil and gas, they understand this very well. You may lay pipe for 15, 20, 30 kilometers without seeing anybody because you and your team only are the ones working there. Sometimes even if the helicopter are the ones to drop you at your location because there is no road channel to where you are working. So they just have to clear it, then uh, lay their pipes, okay? Explosion of chemicals could cause permanent disabilities, which is the more severe case, you understand? Okay, in terms of severity, from broken bones to amputation and breathing in chemicals like H2S for over a prolonged period could cause loss of consciousness, which if not attended to, can lead to death. H2S, before you say, excuse me, help me there, Kalas, and the more you struggle, the easier it is to take you off. So the best option for you to execute this is provision of panic alarm, okay? And most people use uh, uh, oxygen meter, which if the oxygen level is low, it gives you an alarm. Or if there's a chemical substance there, before you go in too deep, it gives an alarm. So this will enable you not to go inside further or just uh, fall back so somebody can come and attend to that, okay? And how effective the action is likely to be in controlling the risk. This must include the intended impact of the action, justification for the time scale that you indicated in your risk assessment, and whether you think your action will fully control the risk, okay? As we said before, training of your employees, provision of panic buttons, respective protective equipment, and remote supervision will have a major impact on the job activities carried out in confined space. You see, you are telling them that all this, your justification and your recommendation of things to be put in place, if they provide them, sure people will go. Though there is 0.001% that accident might happen, but all the time, as long as you are completely prepared, it will not be as severe as when you are not prepared at all, okay? This will stop workers from risking their lives when they are aware of the risk associated with the tasks they are about to carry out. Because you already give them training, you already give them all the panic buttons, panic alarm, and so on and so forth. They know how to use it. They know the risk associated with their work, so there's no problem. Six month time scale has been given for the draw up plans and budget for creating all emergency procedures for all confined space work, which must be approved by the managing director. Okay? I hope with this given time scale, all procedures have been put in place together with all protective equipment. These are the things that the impact that you're risking, your risk, the risk you assessed is going to eliminate all those hazards. And if it cannot be eliminated completely, protective equipment has been put in place together with the procedure, which Again, you go back to your hierarchy of control. What are the procedures, the administrative control, the permits to work? Because it's a high-risk activity area. So in the permit to work, it has been explained there, the type of risk associated with that job, how many hours they have to spend there, how many hours they have to go on break. You see, all these things have been specified in the permit to work, okay? If you have any questions, kindly write down below in the comments so we can take your questions or you can join Africa HSC group, which is the very, very first organization which is founded by an African in the United Arab Emirates. These guys have the best, you know, trainers. There are classes on Friday, free classes. It's free, of course. You don't have to pay for anything. Okay, which if you attend, you are going to gain more knowledge. You are going to gain more, in short, 
you will gain more than what you have been taught in class because there are revisions of past questions, there are questions that come. Even sometimes you find out that job positions for safety officers that do come up, that okay, somebody will just tell you, uh, please, in our company, we need five or ten safety officers. If you are the board certified or you are your certified or level six diploma certified, please kindly submit your CV to so and so and so email address. This is how we assist each other. We grow in numbers. So when we assist everyone and you pass in peace, it will be easier for you also to teach others for them to pass because we know it's not been easy. So thank you very much for your time. We hope to see you soon. If you'd like to continue to the part four, the review communication and check, you check the link down below, okay? Or you click uh, the icon button that shows on your screen for the part four. This is the new Nebosch format. So I'm putting this for you guys to understand how you are going to go about it. Always remember, paraphrase your word and don't copy what I wrote. This is for you as a guideline. So you understand which way to pass, what to write and what not to write. Okay? Thank you very much and have a lovely day ahead. Ciao.